All right, good evening. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I think uh, we've gotten most everybody in that's uh, been waiting to come in. So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Chris Hines. I'm Deputy Superintendent in the Conroe Independent School District, and uh, I'll be facilitating this presentation tonight along with Mr. Chris McCord, Assistant Superintendent for Operations. Also on our call this evening is uh, Sarah Blakelock, our Director of Communications, and Jessica Villarreal. Uh, my assistant. So we're going to go ahead and get started and uh, try to try to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, if you were not able to join us uh, roughly about a month ago, we, we did our initial presentations. And so we'll try to kind of like a Netflix, Netflix recap at the beginning. We'll try to try to catch everybody up a little bit. Um, this is a picture of uh, Gordon Reed Elementary School and Gordon Reed Elementary School is a school built for about 950 students. It's under construction currently. It is scheduled to open in August of 2022. It's going to serve students in grades pre-K through four or pre-K through sixth grade. And we'll talk a little bit more about those configurations a little bit further into our presentation. It is going to be located at 2045 McCaleb Road. And this is just a picture of it. And, and, and off in the background, I'll so move my cursor over here. But that's McCaleb Road, and so the driveway coming in off, uh, and that is a picture of the construction site. Behind it, you'll notice there's certainly an area that is room for a future uh, school site, so that is also part of the school district's um, future plans for growth. And then this is just a map to kind of orient um, you to the location if you're not from the western part of the Conroe School, but school District. Uh, you may not be as familiar, but if you went out 2854 uh, and then went north on McCaleb Road, uh, that is Gordon Reed Elementary School, and you can kind of see the relationship to the rest of Conroe. Uh, so hopefully that gives you an idea of the, the location. Why is it necessary for the district to readjust boundaries? As you know, the number one reason is when we open a new school, because we're a fast growing district, we do open uh, schools pretty regularly. And so this is the next school that will open in the Conroe Independent School District. Also from time to time, and when we do, uh, we do this process because we might have a need, we have crowding at a school or we have capacity at another campus and we just need to come in and make some adjustments. But uh, as a general rule, we try not to do boundary adjustments unless it's really necessary. Uh, but building a school is it's going to be necessary. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the, the Conroe feeder. This is an elementary map. And just to kind of get everybody familiar a little bit with it, kind of start, I'll start on the east side of it. And really, this is still part of our district over here. This is the part of the Caney Creek feeder. But as you move in, this, this what, it look, what probably appears to be orange on your screen is the Wilkinson area, and it kind of goes south of the loop. And you can see it also currently at Wilkinson Elementary also includes uh, Grand Central, the, the development Grand Central on the west side of 45. And it's a rather large area. It's also a fast growing area, and it's an area that we're watching. And, we know that eventually we'll run out of room at Wilkinson in the future. And this is Runyon, it's a little bit like a, kind of a teal color and a little bit for the north of Wilkinson area, kind of really uh, 1314 runs right through the middle of it, just to get you oriented. And if you're from that zone, uh, you know that's also an area that's uh, experiencing some rapid growth. This is the Patterson Elementary uh, elementary zone. And it also, and it's rather, it's a rather large area and it too is experiencing a lot of rapid growth. And this is Anderson, kind of in the yellow color. And then um, again, rather large area, uh, extends all the way really into town. And then this is the brown is uh, the Reeves attendance boundary. As you get over here, this is uh, Houston Elementary. And then it kind of uh, bleeds over here and barely close in town. We have a lot more density in this Armstrong Elementary. And then going across uh, 45, you can see we get into uh, the green, the light green, which is Rice Elementary's attendance boundary. The blue is our current Singer boundary. And the green area is our current Stewart Elementary boundary. And, and most of what we discussed this evening really will revolve around the impact of that area, but, but other parts are also impacted. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And this is the current map of our current intermediate feeders in the Conroe uh, attendance or high school feeder uh, intermediate. So just to kind of uh, look at it, the going from west to east, going back where we started, this is Stewart. And the reason Stewart's zoned that way, if you're those of you who aren't familiar, Stewart is a K through sixth grade configuration. So their intermediate grades are served at Stewart Elementary. 
And then as we move a little bit further over to the west, the yellow represents Cryer Intermediate, and it's mostly on areas that are uh, west of 75 and 45. And then the kind of the, the, the purple color that's interior is Travis Intermediate School. And then the blue, which kind of surrounds that uh, rather large area is uh, Bosman. And this next map is actually some of the areas that are shaded that we're experiencing some fast growth in the district. And so just to, and really just as an illustration of the fact that it's not just one part of the Conroe feeder, it really is uh, all of our areas that are, that are experiencing some growth. And it's something that we are mindful of and trying to think of how, how to deal with that in the future, right? how to respond to that. So we ended, just to kind of touch a little bit on enrollment and growth, we ended the 2020-21 school year with an enrollment of uh, roughly 65,428 students. But on November 1st this year, we were at 67,973 students. And so probably this week we'll hit 68,000 students. And that's a pretty good jump, uh, 2,500 students roughly uh, from, from where we ended the year this year. And typically we, we grow about 1,200 to 1,500. And so we know that this had something to do with COVID because we, were, we probably didn't have as much growth last year as we anticipated, but we caught up with this year's growth um, and it's still continuing. On November 1st, our district-wide kindergarten through fourth grade enrollment was 26,322 students, which is utilizing at campuses that are using utilizing 89 portable classrooms. We are at 99% of our classroom capacity in elementary grades in our district right now. Our intermediate enrollment was 10,199 students. We were at 96% capacity and we were still we were uh, utilizing 14 portable classrooms. Our junior high um, is at 102% of capacity and we do have a, a larger Moorhead Junior High School which is in the Caney Creek feeder that will open uh, in two years and or a year and a half from now and that will uh, provide an additional uh, 650 seats in the junior high area, but until then we're, we're tight. You know, we're very crowded in junior high. We just did an addition at, um, at York Junior High and the Grand Oaks feeder as well, but uh, you can see we've experienced some very rapid growth. And then high school enrollment, we're at 94% capacity, utilizing 28 classrooms. Uh, as a total, just to put in perspective, our district currently uses, utilizes 167 portable classrooms throughout the district, which is equivalent roughly to about 3,000 seats. And uh, certainly it's something, uh, or another way of putting it, about three elementary schools. And so we know we're, we're growing. We know we're going to need some more um, schools in the future. So uh, something I'll need to be thinking about and preparing for. Our, as we look in the future, our 2028 projection for the Conroe Elementary School feeder is uh, roughly 9,374 students. And with the opening of Gordon Reed Elementary, we will have capacity of 7,900 students. So we know by 2028, we, we're going to be short room and we know we're going to have to have uh, probably two more schools in the next six years uh, to alleviate and meet that growth. Uh, so we know that's coming. Uh, also, our intermediate school, we're facing the same kind of growth uh, with the opening of Gordon Reed, assuming that's a fifth, sixth configuration, we will have a capacity of roughly 3,150 fifth and sixth grade seats, um, and, and we are projected need for 1,750 seats in the next six years in addition to that, so um, we, we know that we're going to keep growing, so we're at 4,904, we'll have 3,150 we're probably two intermediate schools from where we need to be in the next uh, few years. So it's just something that we have to think about. And that's why we have that space behind uh, Gordon Reed Elementary. We, we anticipate, we don't know that that's up to our, our board to make that decision in the future, but it, it is possibly a site for an, a future intermediate school to serve that part of the district. Uh, so anyway, we are seeing some growth and it's something that we're having to think about and plan for. So this particular process, we've talked about it already. Um, this school is, is going to be on McCaleb. We know that Stewart Elementary is currently over capacity. It has an enrollment of 1,121 students using two portable classrooms. And, uh, but we're, they're having some rapid growth at that school. We expect to be over 2,000 students um, in 2028. So that's our number one priority in this process is what can we do to alleviate Stewart? But while we're doing that, we're going to look at Giesinger Elementary School, and they're over 
capacity. We currently have eight portable classrooms there. They're running at roughly 120% capacity. So, um, and those of you that live in the Geesing or feeder zone that are on this call, you know that that's, that's a reality. And so we're going to be looking at how to manage the population at Geesinger through this process. And uh, so we'll talk about that. Patterson Elementary is also a school we have our eye on because it's getting near capacity. Um, and Wilkinson also is approaching their, their, their coming up at 800. And uh, so they're going to, but they're going to be at 1100 by 2028. We know there's a lot of future growth going in that area. And then Running Elementary is also crowded. We're just, we're at 101% capacity right now, I believe. So again, it's, it's getting crowded there. It's not a very big school if you're familiar with Runyon. And then Cryer Intermediate, which has a capacity of 900 students, it currently has an enrollment of 750 students. So we still have a little bit of room there, but they're projected also to keep growing. And some of the areas that we'll look at this evening, um, particularly in the Geesing area, are also areas of future growth that would impact uh, Cryer's uh, projected growth. So um, when we make adjustments, uh, we know that we'll also be managing uh, Cryer as well as Geesinger. And then finally, I'll mention Bosman is right at capacity. Uh, they have an enrollment of 939 students. And, you know, again, that's going to, it's an area that's growing. If you've been out there recently, you know what I'm talking about. There's a neighborhood going in right across the street. So uh, quite a bit of growth in that area. So again, this is just this, a lot of that information in a chart form, just to kind of give an il illustration of, of where we are and, and where we're experiencing some, some crowding. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, one of the questions we always get a lot about is, is capacity. And, and the hardest thing about capacity is, is it, it can move, uh, depending on special programs, depending on, uh, if you're familiar with elementary school, we, we, we set our class size at 22 to one. And so you could have, you know, a couple of students move into first grade and that requires another classroom for another teacher, but we only really went two students over the that number. And if I'm a school that has a bilingual program and a monolingual program, and that happens in, that could happen twice in the same grade. And so you, and you have five grades or six grades in the building, it could happen 10 times. So you can see how classrooms are on a, a kind of a moving target and capacity is, is in motion, especially at the elementary schools where we have the 22 to one cap. So uh, the best we do with, with uh, our, capacities is just kind of use averages and, and try to guess, um, but it is a moving target. So this, is, this does illustrate our, our challenges and what's coming. And you can see our projections in 2028, and we know we're going to keep going and we know we're going to have to respond. And that's something that the committee is certainly looking at because we know that as we work through this process that we may, um, you know, we know we'll have another future elementary school and we're trying to have an idea about, okay, if that happens, who do we want to move then? So we try not to move families twice in a, in a short period of time. So that's something that we're going to try to look at and be mindful of. Now, we'll say that a future elementary is not in this current bond package. So that's something that we don't have a firm answer on. Yes, we're going to have a new elementary on this date at this time. So um, that's not something that we know the answer to, but we can anticipate the need for based on our growth. So what are we trying to accomplish in this process? We're trying to accomplish, first and foremost, we're opening an elementary, who's gonna go there? So we're trying to accomplish that, right? Establishing the attendance boundary and who's going to make up this new community that will be Gordon Reed Elementary School located on McCaleb. Uh, we also, at the same time, wanna provide relief to Stewart in this process. And we're also gonna, our another priority is to provide relief to Giesinger because, um, this is our, our really our west side of the district solution for, for a pretty good period of time. And um, the next elementary I would anticipate will be on the east side of the Conroe feeder. And so that will impact schools uh, such as Patterson and Anderson and, and Wilkinson. And so we'll talk, you know, as we get into the future, so we wanna be mindful of that. So this would be probably our, our west side elementary solution for, the, for uh, a few years. And then we want to also be mindful of what we can do to, to leave some room at Stewart for future growth, to leave some room at Reed for future growth, and leave some room at Giesinger for future growth and at Cryer. So uh, those are kind of goals through this process that we want to be mindful of. And why is it challenging? We know this process is challenging because schools are communities. 
Families often have a history of attending a particular school and families often choose where they live to go to a particular school. And so we, we understand that. We understand that this is not something that, in, that we would do without really looking at all the options and we don't take this process lightly. And so uh, our committee understands that. We have a great committee, by the way. It's made up of principals and parents representing the entire feeder and they've done a great job and they have really worked hard on this process and looked at a lot of questions. And so um, it's a group of people that's very mindful of the impact and they don't, they don't take this task lightly. We also have several district staff that are working in this process. And then we, we also involve several people that are as resources that really don't vote in the process, but they're there to help us, you know, everything from making maps to looking at bus routes and how that might impact transportation. And um, so we have a lot of great, great folks that, that work with us on this. Uh, Mr. Chavez, I'll point out, is our director of community outreach and dropout prevention. And um, and he is always so kind as to come back and, and re-record this in Spanish and make it available for our families that would prefer to have this in Spanish. So thank him. So just briefly, I'll mention the goals. Uh, our goals are used to kind of guide us through this process. We always are mindful um, that we want to provide for the education and well-being and the welfare of all of our students, and it's our mission. Uh, we want to draw boundaries that support efficient and effective use of our school facilities and resources. We also want to be fiscally responsible to the public, so we know that. We're not going to leave a school half empty forever. Um, if we leave it light, it's because we think it's going to grow into it. Uh, we, try to be used, we try to use the facilities that taxpayers are paying for, and uh, we do want to be mindful of that. We also want to develop scenarios that um, and present those scenarios. And we've been trying to do that with, by putting up scenarios on our website. We still have, we're down to three. We'll talk about those. We, all, we do want to plan for future growth. We do want to reduce enrollment at, at our overcrowded campuses. One of those things we're trying to do is reduce our dependency on portable classrooms. It's really hard to do. You know, I've been doing this a lot of years and it seems like about time we get portables moved off of one building, we're in it, putting them in another. Uh, but we really are trying to reduce that uh, for the well-being and the safety of our students. And then we want to communicate uh, changes. And so that's part of what we're doing tonight is trying to communicate what we're looking at. Now, we are actually in the second part of this process. There's a three-tier kind of a three-step process on the, on the public facing side, although it's ongoing on the website. And I'll just mention that, that we have a website and I'm going to um, kind of drag over a website in front of the screen and take a minute and talk a little bit about our website. Nice resource. So on, this is the main page of the Conroe Independent School District website. And uh, if you land on the main page, I'm gonna click on the roadmap to remaining open. Whoops, that's the wrong thing. I'm gonna go back. That is a neat, that's a neat site too. Uh, here it is, ABC, learn more. So I'm gonna click on the ABC. And there's some information about the district and the growth and the goals and things that we look at in this process. Uh, there's, this is the button you would click on to get more information about this process. There's a website for Gordon Reed Elementary. It doesn't have a lot of information yet. You know, from a timeline, we get this question a lot. What is the timeline? So our goal is to try to get a recommendation to the board in January. Um, and to do that, you know, that's kind of starts a whole nother set of actions such as, uh, you know, figuring out which students are going to be there. So by, by March, we'll do the transfer process for those students that want to finish their last year at the elementary. Um, we'll do the staffing. So we have to look at, you know, teachers that might have to move from one school to the next school. We'll have a principal named in the spring. Uh, they'll go through a process of, of identifying, you know, school colors and a mascot and so all that happens in the spring, but it really can't happen until we figure out who the community is that's going to make up the new school. And so um, we're kind of in that process now. Uh, going back to this, so there, there will be information as we get more things decided on that website. There's also a place to submit feedback. This has been really helpful. We captured all. We ask that you put your feedback here. I know we've had some emails and some other forms of communication, but this is most helpful for us because we basically put it into a spreadsheet and give it to our committee when we meet. And so it's really helpful. We can kind of consolidate it. So there's a little place you can put in some things. If you go down, there's some scenarios. There's several scenarios. I think we've looked at probably around 25 scenarios at least at this point. 
And uh, if you want to see what we've looked at, you go under the X, they're no longer under consideration. If you go under the checkbox, uh, those are the, the ones that are currently under consideration. There's three in there right now. We're going to talk about those three tonight. And um, we're going to share a little bit of information about each of them. What I want to point out is there's little minor differences in each of them. And, and really, any of these differences could be mixed and matched to make another scenario. So, you know, and I'll point out what those are in just a moment. But, but other than that, we, we really, what we have in front of you, we think we're getting very close to what we want to recommend. So um, it may not include something where it might include something, but hopefully we're showing you something that might be included. And there's some information about the process. We will have another presentation on November the 9th at Stewart Elementary School at 6.30. It is the same information that we're doing tonight. And uh, so it, it is really pretty much the same thing. We'll also have some computers set up if people wanna give us comments, but, but certainly go to the website if you wanna submit um, your thoughts on the process options that you see and, and things that you might want the committee to look at. So there's some other resources, the maps. For a while, we did have scenarios coming in. We took that down last week because we're at that point now where we've really looked at a lot of scenarios and we need to start moving into the next phase. And so that is the next phase is what we're doing tonight. So I'm going to bring this back. And so, um, so again, that's our web site where you go if you want to submit some feedback for our committee. We will get it to them. We also will consolidate it and share all the committee with our board. Uh, we will we will kind of update the school board in November about where we are. And again, our hope is to come back in January for a final recommendation for the school board. So that's where you can, if you want to look at the scenarios, we've had different scenarios looking at different options. We've had a lot of feedback along the way. I want to say thank you to everybody who's given us feedback. The, um, you know, one of the things we've been looked at a configuration with a K, a K12 and a three, four, five, six scenario. And we looked at a few other things and they didn't really work well from a transportation standpoint, some other things, but we did look at them. And if you want to see some of the different options, they're certainly there. But where you would go on the on the homepage is the under consideration to look at these. There's still a few questions that that haven't been decided by the committee. And you know, you're going to see these in the three scenarios that Mr. McCord shares with you tonight. And, and Mr. McCord is going to kind of walk you through what the what those are. But just I want to point out a few of the questions that I think that are there. And one of them is, where is exactly the split between Stuart and Gordon Reed, right? Where is that boundary going to be split? And you're going to see a couple of minor tweaks. I think we've kind of played with different options and we've got it down to a, two possibilities. So that still hasn't quite been decided, but it is possible that, you know, that's going to be one of those things that's going to show up in one of those scenarios because that area is going to split. Some's going to go, to, some are going to stay at Stewart, some are going to go to Gordon Reed, and you're going to see that. You're going to see 2854 kind of made it to a real natural boundary. Some neighborhoods exit on the 2854, some come out very close to 2854, and it's closer to Gordon Reed, and we looked at that. So all of those are things that, that the committee's looked at. We've looked at mileage, we've looked at um, distance and, and those kinds of things. The other question that you're going to see is how much area from Giesinger gets moved to Gordon Reed or, to, uh, or from Rice gets moved to Gordon Reed. And then there's an area that we looked at from Giesinger that actually gets considered to move to Rice. And so that's part of that alleviating crowding at Giesinger question. And so the, look for that. There'll be a, a few little minor differences in those zones. And so um, we know that some, some of those areas are going to get moved, you know, but there's some that haven't been decided yet. And there's some that there's another possibility. One, one section may go down to rise. The other question that still hasn't is still really under consideration and you'll see it in scenario 6.23 um, is whether or not fifth and sixth grade should just combine at one of those two schools to keep the cohort size of a certain size. And, and really that those of you that are parents that have had students that go through the intermediate level um, probably can understand this better if you haven't had that experience. But, you know, when we split the schools, if we split K-6, and it's very possible that that's what we'll come up with. But if we do, we know that the first few years before we grow back a little bit, we're going to have some really small fifth and sixth grade classes at each school. And, and, and that impacts uh, the size of the cohort so that when students, when they transition to junior high, 
um, it can be a rather, rather a social uh, kind of a adjustment to be made uh, as you go from a kind of a small uh, class size to a, to a big junior high and you're with um, 80 of your friends and you're in a class now of 700 and it's, it's just an adjustment. So it's certainly something that we've talked about and there's pros and cons of that. You know, it impacts transportation, it impacts family dynamics and carpooling and all those things. So it's not something that, that is taken lightly, but there is one option that you'll see that has that configuration and it has been discussed. And then finally, I'll mention that whether or not to move some of these other zones like Patterson and Anderson and Runyon, you'll see they'll show up. There's a couple of minor tweaks. And that has to do with really, you know, could we take a few students from Runyon and, you know, put them over here at Wilkinson? Could we take a few students from Anderson and put them at Houston? And could we take some students from Patterson and put them in Anderson to, to try to buy us some time with these schools and uh, let us kind of deal with our growth over there for a few years? And they're, they're minor tweaks. Those are things that can be done. Or those are things that we might want to delay doing. We might want to wait a year or two and do them. But um, those are things that we're talking about. And you'll see those show up in scenario 6.23 and scenario 7.32. Uh, I'll also mention, and I'll just, I'll, a couple of things I'll mention. One of them is you'll see these, these, I know you're wondering, like, why do you have 7.32, you know? And, what I'll tell you is we started with some basic scenarios and then what happens is people will look at them and they'll change it and it'll change from, you know, we have like a scenario 11 or a scenario 12, but, but some of the ones that have stayed with us, you're seeing. So, you know, six, then there was a second version of the six. So it was a 6.2 and then that got changed to a 6.21 or 6.22. And then, no, we're going to change this, move this little section. And that became a 6.23. So they're basically iterations of uh, the map that we started with and just to help you understand kind of why we have these numbering systems, but it helps us kind of track how the map evolved because we've made changes to maybe what we started with um, in the process. So I want to explain that. Also, I'll explain geocoded just briefly. We use geocoded for planning and geocoded is on our map, we look at who lives in an attendance boundary, right? And that's who we plan for. In reality, when you look up an enrollment and you look at geocoded, they won't match. And one of the reasons is, is because sometimes students, well, we have many students who come to school with their parents who maybe their mom works at the school teaching and they come with mom to work or dad. And um, so that changes the enrollment, right? Students come that don't live in that attendance boundary. The other thing that happens is we might have a transfer or we might have a special program that's not located at another school, but they come to this school for that program. And so we do have enrollment shifts that change, um, but we use geocoding for our planning purposes. I just wanted to clarify that. And then special programs that, you know, that just, I just mentioned special programs. I will just say, we always get that question, you know, which special programs will be at the school. It's always decided by population, our need and space and other options. So we look at a lot of factors, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention two that are, are real uh, reality. One of them is bilingual education. We don't have bilingual education at every school. So but if a school had a large number of students that needed bilingual education, we would have a program there. If we don't have enough to make a class, we might combine with another school. Um, same thing with pre-kindergarten programs. Not all our schools offer pre-K programs. And so that's something that we might not have at every school. We might move it. Uh, certain, you know, in terms of special education, most of our schools offer resource or speech services, um, but not every school has a behavior unit, not every school um, has a life skills unit. And so there's different services that we provide that may not, there may not be enough students at one school to justify having a program. So we, we would cluster it with other schools. So I just wanted to answer that about special programs. I always get that question. And we won't answer, we won't decide the programming till we decide who's going there, right? We'll look at who lives in that area and, and what we need. So that's kind of one of those things that we do later um, in the process. There's a few areas that we're going to reference tonight in these scenarios. I want to make sure I point them out in case you live in some of these areas or uh, just kind of get you oriented. Most of you will look at a map and you'll know kind of where you are. And I apologize. The maps, obviously, when we're showing them to you on the screen aren't as good as the, the big maps. And um, but we do have big maps at each of our elementaries and intermediate schools. So if you are by your school and you want to see one of the bigger maps that has a better road definition and things, you certainly can look at it. 
but you're going to hear some references. And these are some; these are not all of the areas that are that are po possibly up for movement, but these are certainly many of the areas. And I just wanted to take a second and kind of point them out. So if, when you hear us talk about 3A, and this is this is that Austin McCone Road and uh, Villa Capri Apartments, Lake Forest Falls, that area, um, 3B, Steve Owens Road, Shepherd's Landing, Woodmark, Chase Wood, uh, 4B. Gerald Drive, Ballard Circle, House Tree, Christmas Tree Lane, uh, 4D is LaSalle Crossing, Hills of Westlake, 4E, Wedgwood Forest. You'll see 4E goes in different scenarios, moves. Uh, 4G, Terrace Grove, 5E, the Abbey of Conroe Apartments. That's that area. If you come down uh, the feeder from one, south of 105, but before you get to Gladstale on the west side of 45, um, and that's an area that currently goes to Giesinger, and you'll see that area that one of the scenarios shows up as a move. Um, no, no, Noreen, Janice, Toledo, Eloise, Lillian, Adkins, these are all off of First Street near the railroad tracks, um, just kind of moving north um, from Travis. If you're familiar with that area, those are streets that currently go to Anderson. They at one time used to go to Houston several years ago. And one of the scenarios shows them moving back to Houston. So I want to point that out. Uh, 20B, when you're, and, and one of the reasons I point out 15D is when you get into town, it's really hard to see that kind of a small section. So our, our planning units are much smaller as you get into more uh, dense, denser, densely populated areas. 20B is Lake Rollingwood, Champion Village, Champion Forest, Wigman Spring, uh, 35F, and it shows up, that's at Piney Point, it's over off uh, 3083 and Loop 336, and that's an area that shows up in one scenario as being possibly moved out of Runyon into Wilkinson. 81B is an area west of Loop 336 between Woodhaven and 2854, and a lot of that's relative, most of it's undeveloped and some of it's in the wetlands area, but it's certainly an area that we're, we have moved and it shows up um, in this. 82D, Ponderosa City, uh, 82E, Old Kentucky Farms, Leonidas Horton, Warrenberger Road, and then 82F, Montgomery Trace, north of the power line. So those are just a few that, that we're going to talk about. Mr. McCord will mention tonight, but I want to take a minute. So it might help you if you hear him. He'll say the names once, but I think at some point, you know, you'll hear us refer to the letters and it might help you to kind of get that key in your in your mind and you can reference that. Um, it might help you to see where your area is. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McCord, who's going to take you through uh, our three scenarios that we have to share this evening. All right. Well, good evening, whether you're watching us live or whether you're watching us later recorded. We appreciate you joining us for this. I'm going to set the stage on some considerations. I'm going to cover three scenarios, but I need to cover a few things uh, first just to get the ball rolling. First off, I'll talk a lot about relief. When I'm talking about relief, I'm just talking about lowered enrollment at a specific campus when I use the word relief. Uh, I'm not going to really mention relief that often when it comes to Stewart. Uh, really, that relief for Stewart is applicable to all the scenarios and really is the most significant reason uh, for the construction of Gordon Reed Elementary at the site it's located. I will work under each scenario consistently to tell you the resulting population for Gordon Reed and Stewart. Also, the fifth and sixth grade combined cohort classes that would remain at Gordon Stewart and, and Gordon Reed and Stewart as a result of the scenarios we give, how transportation would be impacted, and then ultimately the total number of students impacted by each possibility across all campuses that are involved. Uh, to help understand a, a major factor uh, in determination of the best potential campus for some specific locations. It's important to note the following, and this really goes talking about roads and where they empty into. 81B does not have any pre-K through six students at this time. Uh, it contains many wetlands, although it's not all wetlands. 81B and 81 do not access Fish Creek or McCaleb directly. They access FM 2854. Although if you look at it as a crow flies, they are closer to Stewart. The driving time is actually closer to Gordon Reed. 82D. Ponderosa City over to the west. It does not access Fish Creek directly. It accesses uh, FM 2854. 82F, Montgomery Trace. It uh, does not access FM 2854 directly. It attaches to Fish Creek and McCaleb on the central to western side of that section. Our current average number of fifth and sixth grade students as combined grades 
or also restated as combined cohorts. At district campuses that feature a pre-K through six configuration is 290. Restated, the existing campuses with a pre-K through six configuration average approximately 145 students per grade. That'll be important to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this. I thought I would bring that out and single that out uh, for special attention. So I'm going to cluster the three scenarios being considered into two groups. First, I'm going to discuss one scenario, which has Gordon Reed as a pre-K through six campus and Stewart opening as a pre-K through four campus. The second group of scenarios to discuss has Annette Gordon Reed and Stewart both serving as standalone pre K through six campuses. Within each iteration of the second set of scenarios, I will point out the difference between those two pre K through six plans. As I go through each scenario, the first time a section is named, for example, 3A, I will provide a street or subdivision identification to help you quickly locate the specific section of which I'm referring. To help expedite the process, I will not repeat street names or subdivision names once I refer to that area at least once. So with all that aside, here we go. Let's talk about scenario 6.2.3. Remember, this has Gordon Reed as pre-K through six and Stewart as pre-K through four. Things to note, the details are for zone movement within 6.2.3 include moving from Stewart to Gordon Reed would include zones number one, and just an example street from each area, one, Tejas Creek, two, Magnolia Lake, 3A, Austin Macomb Road, 3B, Steve Owens Road, 3C, Woodhaven, 82D, Ponderosa City, 82E, Old Kentucky Farms, and 82H, which at this time is largely undeveloped, although not completely undeveloped. Note on the northern front, transitioning from Giesinger to Gordon Reed includes 4B, Gerald Road, 4D, LaSalle Crossing, and 4G, Terrace Grove. Uh, departing Rice to attend Gordon Reed includes 81B. Note, no students live in that zone currently. Anderson would send 75 students to Sam Houston as part of 15D also known as Noreen Street and some other areas in the north central part of the city of Conroe. Patterson up to the northeast would send 26 students to Anderson as part of 20B Lake Rollingwood. Gordon Reed would open with a large footprint and as a pre-K through six campus, it would provide relief for a large number of campuses, including Giesinger, Anderson, Rice, Cryer Intermediate, Patterson, and in the future for Bosman Intermediate. Stewart moves to a pre-K through four format with approximately 562 students. Patterson, excuse me, Gordon Reed would open with 686 total students pre-K through six. And just for uh, specificity for Gordon Reed, he would have 402 kindergarten through fourth graders and 284 fifth and sixth graders. So because it would be combined, it would have a larger double cohort or classes in the fifth and sixth grade, more commensurate with other schools that we have of the same pre-K through six configuration uh, within the district. Uh, here is a look, and you can look at the, if you, uh, the previous slide. This gives you kind of a breakdown of the exact details. It's an aggregated slide to show you exactly where it includes the section, the zone, of the descriptions, some example streets, and the totals, and where they're going, coming from, and where they're going to as far as the total impact. Uh, just going down, talking about the intermediate on when it comes to 6.2.3, some things to note that are important. You know, in general, many students would be relocating uh, from fifth and sixth grade at Stewart to go to Gordon Reed. If you're going to Gordon Reed for elementary school in this scenario, you're going to intermediate school too. On the intermediate front, Cryer would send a combined 31 students to Gordon Reed from 4B, 4D, 4G, and 81B. Also, one student would move from Bosman to Travis from 14B, which is also known as Woodside Manor, and also A15 
Holloman Street. It's largely industrial now. And uh, the reason for potentially doing this uh, would be if it does get developed out, Currently, we're looking at uh, Bosman. Bosman's right at capacity today, and it would give a little bit of protection for Bosman in that area uh, for potential growth. So that is an option. This is the most, probably the most transportation friendly option scenario we have. And it would also impact the most total students of a number of 788. So that would be 6.2.3. And uh, Dr. Hines, anything to add regarding that? You want to throw in for color commentary? No, I, you know, I just would point out that I think you make a great, uh, you know, you mentioned about impact and something the committee looks at. So, you know, impact, there isn't a right answer on that, but we do track it. So trying to understand like how many people or how many students got, were moved in order to achieve that, that scenario. And so we do look at that. Obviously our goal, I think in a perfect world, we don't want to move more than we absolutely need to move, um, but but that's a you know that's a it's tough to pin down because sometimes what we're doing is we're having to make decisions like do we do we push off making a solution down the road or do we try to solve now and so it, it, there are some of those things that the committee wrestles with. I just wanted to share that. But thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to a completely different paradigm now, and I'm going to talk about two scenarios that have both Stuart and Gordon Reed as pre-K through six campuses. As we go through this, I will try to, I'll try to contrast them to each other. I'll list out the zone names. Uh, if I've already given you an example street from a zone, I won't do it again for expediency. But uh, so here we go. So let's talk about 6.3.4. You're looking at the elementary map, the potential elementary map for scenario 6.3.4. So here are some details. Moving from Stuart, to Gordon Reed would be set zone one, two, 3A, 3B, 3C, 82D, 82E, and I mentioned 82F because this is a this contrast with the other ones I talked about already. 82F, which is Montgomery Trace north of the electric lines. 82H. Uh, for clarity, really, these zones would also, ascend, would also attend Gordon Reed for intermediate school. On a northern front, transitioning from Giesinger to Gordon Reed for pre-K through six would include three sections, 4B, 4D, and 4G. Right there on the western front for the existing Giesinger zone, and they would make up the eastern front for Gordon Reed in this scenario. Departing Rice to attend Gordon Reed includes 81B. Unique to this scenario, 5E, I believe Dr. Hines will drive us to 5E, the Abbey of Conroe Apartments, which represents 26 students, moved from Giesinger to Rice. Gordon Reed opens with a large footprint and is a pre-K through six campus, you can see it there. It provides relief for a number of campuses, including Giesinger, Rice, Cryer Intermediate, Patterson, and in the future for Bosman Intermediate. Gordon Reed would open as a pre-K through six with 569 students, 424-ish kindergarten through four, and 145-ish fifth and sixth. Uh, so it, you'll see this, the, the resultant of this is you'll have a smaller number of kids in each grade, that is the trade-off. Stewart would open as a pre-K through six campus with 678 students, 540 kindergarten through fourth grade, and 138 combined fifth and sixth graders. Intermediate notes on the intermediate slide. Uh, obviously, in general, many students will be relocating from intermediate school at Stewart to go to Gordon Reed. And if you're going to Gordon Reed for elementary school, you're going there for intermediate school too. There are no transportation concerns and uh, of impact, which is very important to us, it is the lowest impact with uh, less than 600 students. 595 students would be impacted in this particular version known as 6.3.4. Uh, Dr. Hines, any thoughts to add? No, I think I, I apologize for being clumsy, point out 5E. Five, five I'll do it one more time, but it's right in this area, right in there. And um, but that would be an area that would move from Giesinger to Rice under under that scenario. But I think you you, you really did 
hit on on those and I'll, I'll move that slide to that. I don't know if you wanted to, you mentioned the totals already, but yeah, that's one of the, that's, this is the, well, I think the scenario with the least impact that we've looked at. I do want to point out that I think for the committee at this point, any of these slight changes that you see within the three, and we'll look at certainly the feedback that we receive after tonight and Tuesday, but all of those are in play. And I just want to make that clear. So if, if something gets eliminated, if we eliminate one scenario, we might take a scenario and say, hey, we like 6.34, but if we only tweak this thing, we would like it more. Um, that could happen. So there could be at the end, we might present a, a 6.35, for example, with a change um, that could happen. So I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to be real clear if you're watching and, or, or come to our presentation that just because you don't, you see something in 6.3 or 2.3 and not, and not in 6.34 that we couldn't borrow a good idea from one and mix it with the other. I just wanted to, to let, let that be known. Okay, so I'm going to transition to the last scenario to talk about tonight. The second scenario in the group of scenarios that have both Annette Gordon-Reed Elementary and Stewart as pre-K through six campuses. And this one is known as 7.3.2. And details for movement within scenario 7.3.2 include, and I'll quickly go through the things that are consistent with the other, the earlier one, but I'll try to sp specify clearly the differences. So moving from Stewart to Gordon Reed would be sections one, two, three A, three B, three C, 82D, 82E, and 82E, 82H, 82E and 82H total there. On the Northern front, this is slightly different. So I'd pay attention here. On the Northern front, transitioning from Giesinger to Gordon Reed correspondingly, for pre-K through six would include 4B, 4D, and 4G, as we talked about earlier, but also 4E. This is currently the only scenario, although it could change, the only scenario where 4E, Wedgwood Forest moves to Gordon Reed. Of course, that's subject to change. Uh, departing from, to departing Ross to attend Gordon Reed, as we talked about earlier, would be 81B. Some important other things besides the 4E differentiation that differ from 6. Point, in ways that 7.3.2 differ from 6.3.4 are Runyon would send 21 students in 35F Piney Point to Wilkinson. Anderson would send 75 students to Sam Houston as part of 15D in the northern part of the city. Patterson would send 26 students to Anderson as part of 20B. On the intermediate front, one student would move from Bosman to Travis from a combined 14B and A15. This scenario, 7.3.2, would provide relief for a large number of campuses, including Giesinger, Runyon, Anderson, Rice, Cryer Intermediate, Patterson, and in the future for Bosman Intermediate. At its opening, Stewart would be a pre-K through six campus with 705 students, 562 K through pre-K or K through four, 143 five through six. Gordon Reed would open at 557 students pre-K through six, 414 kindergarten through four, and 142 combined fifth and sixth. Intermediate notes, just on the intermediate front, in general, many students will be relocating just to Stewart from Gordon Reed to from Stewart to Gordon Reed for intermediate school. If you're going to Gordon Reed for elementary in this scenario, scenario, you're going to intermediate two. And for intermediate specificity, we talked about that one student from Bosman to Travis over in the com current commercial zone. There are no transportation concerns. The students impacted would be 680. So this would fall in the middle range of our three scenarios as far as total impact. And that would be 680 students. Dr. Hines, thoughts? Anything to add, sir? No, I think you, you hit on it. There's just a couple of minor differences on this one. And, and we talked about um, where we pulled in a, a small number of students into Wilkinson from Runyon. And again, I think the thing that the committee struggles with is, you know, that there might be room at Wilkinson now, but we know 
there won't be a few years from now, just as there won't be a few years from now for Runyon and, and a few years from now for Patterson or Anderson. And so we, you know, at a school like Houston is a little bit more stable. So moving some students into Houston in terms of its growth and, and enrollment at stable is, is a real possibility. Um, what, what I think the committee has been wrestling with is, you know, these other moves may, may be moves that we might have to undo if we have another school, let's just say that's located Northeast and we have to start moving back towards the East or towards the Northeast. And so it's something that the committee is going to, is really weighing heavily. Like, do we do these little minor changes now or not? And uh, we're trying to work through that and, and try to make the best decision because we do need to do some tweaks to give us buy some time, but at the same time, we don't want to move families and then three years from now or four years from now do it again. Um, you know, I get that question a lot, like how often do we try to do this or not do it? We try to make it with an elementary change at least four years so that if a student is in kindergarten, they wouldn't be in three schools, um, you know, during that four year period. So, um, so we try not to do that. So we're trying to be mindful and think out four years out. And so we don't have to come back and move people just to give you an idea of what we're thinking and, and why we're thinking it. So um, that, that was a pretty good explanation there, Mr. McCord. And I think you hit on a lot of things. So I'll give it back to you. Well, thank you. Okay, I guess we'll go to the next slide now, Dr. Hines, I believe. And Roger, so just considerations, and I'm not going to read all of them, but you know, first off, a big shout out to the committee. We've had a great committee. We've met often. They've been patient. They've been understanding. They've asked a lot of great questions and they bring a lot of expertise as far as knowing the area and the streets and the schools and campuses and seeing the big picture. So committee members that are watching, thank you. We appreciate your time and we're not done yet, but we appreciate you. But just some of the things that have been considered are being considered and will be continue to be considered. You can look at here. But, you know, the feeder pattern, school history, the geographical proximity. In other words, we don't want to have people travel any further than they really need to. The thoroughfares where streets empty out onto. We talked about that. Possible location of future schools, projected future enrollment. You looked at that uh, chart. It gave all the information. Transportation, walking, demographic factors, and your input. And your input is important which is why we uh, reviewed this for a period of months and months to get it right. So those are just some, but not all, in any particular order of the considerations that we have. I would make a special note here at upcoming events. Just, you know, revert, working backwards from the end is that in January, the tentative plan, subject to change, would be to recommend, make a recommendation from the committee to the board uh, for the adoption of the scenario that would result in the boundaries for the Conroe High School elementary feeder zone feeding on the west side of the area. So that would be in January, potentially. Uh, but we have an upcoming presentation, uh, November 9th, also known as next Tuesday at Stewart at the uh, Stewart Elementary School. And that'll be at 6.30 p.m. Now I would emphasize, as Dr. Hines alluded to earlier, it's the same presentation we did tonight. And so uh, feedback is done electronically, whether it's done through our the website that Dr. Hines showed you or we'll have computers set up the night of uh, the ninth Tuesday at Stewart, uh, where we would give this same presentation or something very similar again. Uh, but the, uh, the feedback is electronic. But if you have viewed this, there wouldn't be anything new that would be revealed on Tuesday night. But we would like to hear what you have to say. It's guided us so far and we genuinely value it. And the committee listens to it and they see your input and we review it. So. Uh, biggest thing next Tuesday tonight, Tuesday tonight. So we don't take it lightly. We spent a lot of time, uh, special effort salute, working for many months before we even started with the committee to Jessica Villarreal and Regina Woody Crane. They've been working on data and zones for months and months. And so a special shout out to them. And whatever it does, we're going to provide a, a quality educational experience at all our schools and as I said, we're hoping to have a recommendation in January. Thank you, Mr. McCourt. You know, we, we have a lot of questions. Um, we've had several that have come in. We'll take a minute just to touch on some of these. And, and then we're looking also at our Q&As to see if any come in. We'll try to answer those. But um, which, you know, which grade levels will be impacted? So you, you've seen the scenarios. We know that it's... Um, 
a K through six configuration at Stewart. So we know K through six is going to be impacted in this process uh, one way or the other, right? And one of the scenarios showed all the K six for that feeder going into one uh, school. The other one showed being split as two K sixes. Um, and so we did look at intermediate boundaries. You saw some minor tweaks. There are, some, there are several areas that are in the Giesinger that when they move over to read, they're going to be moving over for intermediate as well. So um, that does impact the crier feeder zone. And then you saw that there was a, two areas that largely are industrial right now or commercial, but uh, we, we have on two of the maps showing that moving from Bosman to Travis and really is uh, Mr. McCord mentioned mostly as a, you know, just planning out in case there is some development that goes in those areas, giving us some not overcrowding Bosman any faster than we know it's going to grow. And then also, um, you know, special programs. We talked about that earlier on in the presentation, you know, Title I, bilingual, special education, pre-K. Um, right now we have two pre-K classes, I believe, over at Stewart. Um, you know, depending on where the students live, we may move the pre-K to read, and they may not have pre-K at Stewart. So all the pre-K may go to read or so on. We'll have to look at that once we know where the boundaries are, but, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, Right now, Stewart is not a title school. When we split it, um, I do not know that either of these schools will end up being a title school. Uh, but again, until we define the, the boundaries, we really don't know that uh, for sure. Bilingual, currently we don't have a bilingual program in the feeder. And certainly once we again, uh, I'll think, believe the students go to, to, to Reeves, maybe for bilingual classes. And so that live in the current Stewart once we have a new boundary, we'll have to reevaluate that. And again, it may not happen in year one. It may happen down the road, but certainly it's something we'll look at. Uh, you know, we always get the question about my child's going to be in their last year. We're, we're going to move. We want to finish. Can we finish? And the answer is we, we do allow transfers to complete the last year at their home school, but we do not provide transportation. So um, that would be if you can provide transportation to that. If there's a younger sibling, they can have that transfer as well. So yes, students are allowed to finish their last year at their home campus. So if you're moving from Giesinger and you're going into fourth grade, they can finish there in fourth grade. Or if they were um, in a K-6 or being moved from one of the other scenarios in a fourth grade would be the last year or in the case of Stewart, sixth grade uh, or an intermediate would be sixth grade. Um, how likely... Um, will my neighborhood be rezoned? Again, you've seen pretty much all the areas that are in play. And, uh, I, you know, it is important that even if your area is not in play, if you have an opinion, please feel free to, to let us know your comments. Um, so what is next is, we, again, Mr. McCord mentioned we have an upcoming presentation on Tuesday nights, the same material as this. We will uh, also have some computers if you want to give feedback. We're just just showing what we're looking at right now. After that, our committee is going to come back together starting next week. We'll start meeting again. And for the next month or so, we'll be working on trying to, to come up with our final recommendation. We'll be back in um, early part of January to show what we're going to recommend to the board. And at that point, we will, as a committee, have made a decision. But, but we, will, um, we do want to come back and share that publicly before we actually make that presentation to the board. Uh, so that look for that in those dates that we alluded to earlier in January. Those are those third rounds. I'm going to go back January 10th and the 11th. We'll, we'll share what the committee is going to recommend. So that's our work for our committee between uh, really the next six weeks or so to really work on that. And those are really our questions tonight. Uh, hopefully we've gotten them all. Mr. McCord, anything else that you wanted to add? Now, if you want to go back and watch this again, I believe it will be recorded for uh for the future. So thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for everyone who's been on the call and um, have a great evening.